It's good to be here. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful sunny day. So I appreciate you taking the time to sit in front of a, a laptop or an iPad. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, hosting this discussion today about AI, artificial intelligence and faith. We've got a really great panel of guests and speakers uh, to introduce to you. Um, we have Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner, who is uh, formerly the senior rabbi to reform Judaism. Welcome to you, Rabbi Laura. I'm also pleased to welcome Neil Lawrence, who's the DeepMind Professor of Machine Learning at the University of Cambridge. Um, also pleased to have uh, Nicoletta Akatrinai, uh, theologian and economist who's focusing on faith and work and AI at Princeton University. Uh, we also have Yaakov Chowdhury, who's an independent scholar formerly of the, the Cambridge Muslim College, who also is a bit of a specialist in AI and Islam. And finally, but last but not least, uh, Nathan Maladin, who is a senior researcher at the faith think tank Theos, who's written and done some work on AI as well. Welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for joining us. Just briefly before we kick off, a little reminder of what the, the format of this session is going to look like. I'm going to ask some questions and encourage a discussion among our panel uh, for about 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, and then at the end, we'll uh, open the floor to questions from our guests. You can write those in the chat. Um, or you can uh, wave your hand at the right moment and I'll, I'll come to you and you can ask them yourself. So while you're listening to the discussion, please do be thinking of any questions, ideas you want to pick up on uh, to challenge or, uh, or go further. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end of the session to, to dive in, into that. Um, but to start off with, um, I wanted to, to come to you first, actually, Neil, if that's all right. Um, you're uh, obviously working on this day to day at, at Cambridge. Could I ask you, what do you think are some of the most imminent and all the most significant developments in AI research that we might not know about? What things are kind of coming around the corner, which society, communities of faith and everyone will be grappling with in the future that people aren't yet talking about? Oh, uh, people aren't yet talking about. Um, that's a tricky one. So I think that the thing that I, I'm not saying it's a, not necessarily a research thing, but I think perhaps the thing that people aren't talking about that um, uh, will will notice more and more is the inability of the systems we've got to be sort of generally adaptive to uh, evolving circumstances. So there's a lot of talk which I, is, is not going to come to fruition about sort of robots that are going to walk amongst us and operate like other human beings or be our companions or act in, in a way that um, is similar to the way we expect our existing companions uh, to act. And I think we've got nothing. We've got virtually nothing on that front. So I think that's something that we're not going to see. Um, I think the thing that we're seeing that is sort of surprising over what we expected say 10 years ago is the, just the power of enormous amounts of data to, to do things that are quite remarkable, like getting computers to draw drawings for us of armchairs that look like an avocado which is a very human thing and very impressive to do. And I think that's very surprising um, and, and exciting. And, and I think what we're gonna see is a lot of people getting creative with technology like that, um, which will take us in some exciting directions. But what I don't think we're going to see is uh, sort of companions, AI companions that are, are anything like uh, human companions. Hey. Yeah, I'm just going to see if I can grab some food. Yeah. So, so do you do you think that some of the more kind of dystopian, pessimistic uh, kind of sci-fi portrayals, you know, films like uh, Ex Machina or Her are actually still so far in the realm of science fiction, they're not really worth kind of engaging with when it comes to kind of future casting, as it were? I, they're, they're, they're very powerful narratives. And, and of course, films are about being interesting for people. Um, but actually that's where I kind of find the, so um, the interaction between faith and AI quite interesting because I, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer myself, but what I do find in religious texts is enormous amount of much more interesting stories about what it means to have omniscient, all powerful, all seeing beings amongst you than a lot of the narratives we're getting in the media today. And so I, I think that Yes, those, those films are entertaining and we should enjoy them, but actually there's some really interesting questions um, like, you know, can AI present geno prevent genocide is sort of very similar to the question, why doesn't God prevent genocide, right? And, and actually, as you start looking in uh, to religious answers to those type of questions, I think you get a much more sophisticated understanding of the sort of problems that we face, because you don't need a con conscience omnipotent AI. In fact, you can have 
uh, just a surveillance society. Um, and a surveillance society is the type of thing that we already have developed. And, and what does that mean for us as individuals and our freedoms and who we are? Mm -hmm. And I think that's here today. You don't need super intelligence or anything like that. You already have that. Rabbi Laura, I saw you nodding ahead there. Do, do you agree with what Neil was saying? I often do, it has to be said. Um, and I certainly, you know, the talking robot fantasy is, I also think is off the scale, but fear is actually much more about our fears projected onto AI than reality, it seems to me. Um, I love what Neil said about uh, religions asking these questions. And I think that what is fascinating and useful for this sphere of uh, religion and AI is to look at what religions say about the search for the almighty. So what comes to me is that we, so in the Torah and the Hebrew Bible, it says that the God is not so far from you. The Torah is not in heaven. You have to own it. And I think one of the things that concerns me about AI is people are like, oh, it's so overwhelming. I don't understand it. I don't understand. It. No, get in there. We have agency and it's not so far away. And it's for humans to have agency and responsibility and the same old bog standard answers of take responsibility, ask the ethical questions should be applied to AI just as they should have been applied to, I don't know, Neil often talks about this, you know, the industrial revolution or the bicycle or whatever it is. So I think we are here to ask those questions that have been asked, but with a message that as humans, it is our duty to be actively engaged and not just to hand over agency and be too frightened and end up in ridiculous scenario, fantasy scenarios about robots. Hmm. So it sounds like some of you, you're saying that really people of faith, religious communities, religious leaders should be taking a, 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 a frontward step, a, a central place in, in thinking about the ethics and the development of AI, not abandoning that to yes. Silicon Valley or to, to government regulators. What would that look like? Would that look like, I don't know, having bishops and rabbis and imams meeting with with um, AI companies and helping them shape a code of ethics? How would that look like in practical that, terms? That would look like that as part of civil society, not with, I mean, I don't believe that religious leaders should have sort of a special shiny place on any throne, but as part of the general society, civil society, religious leaders should be sitting on those boards um, as part, of, but not because we are special or have some fantastic relationship with the, the almighty, but because we are you know, community leaders or we're in touch with community and we've been dealing with issues of textual study and meaning, just like other people who aren't religious. So I think we should give in them. What concerns me about uh, religious leaders who deal often in otherness is that religious leaders might hide and be frightened and hide in otherness and think, oh no, this is, and deal with the otherworldly. No, get in there, is my message. Um, Nathan, I wanted to come to you to, to say, to ask, in your kind of research and your reading around how particular Christianity and other faiths kind of interact with AI, do you, do you agree that there is something unique that faith has to offer this discussion that you can't get from just reading textbooks or engaging with policymakers? Is there a, a unique perspective that people of faith might have to offer? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I do think we are living in a time where I think we have unique opportunities and I speak, uh, uh, people of faith, I think, have a unique opportunity to, to bring the, the moral resources and the narratives and traditions of our faith to bear on contemporary questions. And I think this is a time to, to ask afresh uh, with urgency what it means to be human. And I think uh, religious traditions, uh, obviously not exclusively, have a lot to say to that uh, question. So this is what I think would be the primary contribution that, that people of faith uh, could be um, making to this contemporary debate. because. Uh, underneath all these developments, the question of human uniqueness, what makes us truly human, I think, is, is constantly being, being asked. I mean, it, it's become a bit of a, uh, of a trope in, uh, in this kind of emerging conversation between AI and, and faith. But really, I think we are being asked to, to re-examine certain assumptions about, about what it means to be human. And I think uh, people of faith can have a lot to, to say to that. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted to talk about personhood, as you say, because it is one of the kind of things that comes up most often in this discussion. There are people say, you know, you might read or hear things saying that if we have in the future a development of, a, of an artificial intelligence that 
um, resembles and in, in how it communicates a human is indistinguishable, does that change, change what we understand that makes humans unique? Um, is there a particular perspective from faith on that question, do you think, about human uniqueness or or uh, does if the development of AI would would radically shift our own self-perception of our own personhood? I actually don't think uh, it has to to shift our own perspective, uh, but it does it does matter what where we locate our human uniqueness. If we locate it in a particular faculty, in a partic particular capability, uh, then I think those are uh, increasingly being uh, challenged. If if calculative intelligence is what we think. Uh, is the defining mark of humanity, then calculative intelligence is something which is growing exponentially and will overtake us. And plus there are all sorts of other categories of, of humans who don't have that calculative intelligence. And I'm thinking particularly of the disabled, of people in vegetative states. I think we, when, when we're thinking about AI, I think we should be constantly thinking about those categories uh, because those really test the limits of our understanding of, of what it means to be human. So I think as a person of, uh, of faith, and I think the Christian tradition would affirm that human uniqueness, it lies not in, in something that we, uh, we can do or uh, our specific faculties, but it has to do with being essentially related to, to the creator, God. Uh, that would be, for me, my understanding of, of what makes human beings unique. We are essentially, fundament uh, uh, fundamentally related uh, and recipients of divine love and capable of reciprocating uh, with, with love. That would be the uniqueness. And I don't see any way in which uh, any kind of technological advancement can threaten, can threaten that. But if you locate human uniqueness, as I said, in intelligence and particular capabilities and functions, uh, I think we are bound to see um, uh, severe challenges from the uh, from technological advancements. Um, Jakob, I wanted to ask you as well. Do you see some of the resonances with what Nathan and others have been saying within your research into how the Islamic tradition responds to a kind of growth of AI? Are there similar questions or concerns about human uniqueness and personhood? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think um, AI is certainly. Um, as a philosophical project, uh, altering or uh, embedding a certain conception of uh, human nature. And it's worth considering the uh, historical uh, legacy which um, current research um, has inherited. So first with the, um, the overthrow of the Aristotelian uh, uh, worldview uh, and Descartes' introdu introduction of a dualistic worldview directly inherited in uh, many sort of implicit in, in, in the in the background in, in some areas of AI research. Um, and then also uh, uh, the, um, the idea of human exceptionalism um, with Descartes that human beings were distinct from animals. And then again, this was, uh, it was a transformative uh, uh, effect of uh, Darwinianism, which uh, brought humans into continuity with the animal world. Um, and now again, we're in a new phase of uh, human self-conception, which is uh, which brings humans into continuity with the uh, machine world. Um, so now human beings are being understood from the standpoint of, of, mach of, of machines. Um, and uh, so what we have is, is rather a mechanization of the understanding of the human mind rather than a, a humanization of the machine. And this is the way, so, so one of the most interesting effect uh, areas um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the new capabilities in terms of computational tools uh, which are influencing areas such as neuroscience. Um, the, 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 these areas are, you know, uh, are tending towards um, more and more physicalist understandings uh, of human nature. Uh, whereas with, with religious traditions, uh, there is, as others, other comment, uh, commentators have, uh, have mentioned, um, there is, a, there is a, a unity with human nature which links uh, human beings with, uh, with God and the rest of the cosmos. Uh, there is an intellig intelligibility of the universe uh, and a correspondence of the human intellect with uh, uh, this, the, the nature of the universe uh, as, as understood by, in religious traditions, as, as understood as created by, uh, by, by God. Um, whereas that uh, intelligibility and structure of the world, uh, as we sort of need knowledge and understanding to machines, uh, there, there's a new perspective coming in about uh, the nature of that intelligibility and how we know the world ourselves. 
Um, so these are really quite significant um, uh, issues for um, uh, for religious uh, groups to understand. Hmm. One of the things when you read around some of the kind of more techno optimist prophets of, of the AI revolution is this idea of transhumanism, the idea that the goal of some in the AI world is, is to develop um, the, the capacities of technology so much that we can eventually transcend our, our human bodies, our hardware, as it were, and become software as, as a kind of final stage of, of human evolution. Is that something, I mean, Neil might have views about whether that's realistic or not, but is that something which, which communities of faith would welcome or oppose, or is there just no consensus yet? I think that there are really some very important discussions, and this one is sort of, is too far away. I think we need to come back to much more fundamental issues of who owns data, who's responsible for it, um, what's happening with the surveillance society that we live under. You know, one of the things that religious communities are really um, good at is discussing and understanding the hidden and the seen. So there is a lot of hidden uh, in the world of AI, and I think it's for us to make it explicit. And so I, uh, the other questions, I, I just, I think they're just too sort of fun. But as a boring old git, I want to talk, you know, sort of nuts and bolts, which are, we live under surveillance society, who the hell is owning this data? What's it doing to people? What's, you know, who's controlling? Let's take it back. I'm, I'm sorry to be sort of boring, but it comes naturally. That's all right. Uh, Nathan? I actually want to agree with uh, Rabbi Laura on, on this. I think there's uh, there are lots of red herrings uh, in this conversation. And I think uh, Neil was very helpful in setting out uh, how, you know, uh, uh, artificial superintelligence and even artificial general intelligence are uh, a bit of a chimera that kind of fascinates us, but I think can, can distract us from the more pressing questions around the use of data, the use of kind of very manipulative uh, addictive technologies and yeah, surveillance capitalism with everything that's bound up with that. But I do want to go back Tim, to your question about kind of um, transhumanism, posthumanism, although that's probably kind of still uh, still out there and quite quite a fringe um, issue. Uh, I think we are seeing uh, developments which kind of point in that direction. I think, you know, what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink, what Facebook is trying to do with kind of um, technology that kind of uh, is much more embedded in our, our physicality. Um, obviously, presented in very benign terms to enable this, uh, particularly those people who don't have kind of uh, not normal cognitive functioning to, to access their wonderful products and technologies. I think there's something nefarious. I think we are moving towards becoming more, uh, more like cyborgs. I think that is a real prospect with various possibilities for implants and emerging of technology and, and the body. So I, I'm really keen not, uh, not to abandon discussions about the role of the body and how, how essential it are our bodies. Are they just wetware or are they fundamental to who we are as human beings? Are they an embarrassment that we are, uh, we are meant to kind of um, get over uh, and move on and get better, to, better hardware? Or are they something uh, special that we should cherish, protect? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that yes, the, the heart of the matter is really what's happening with data and surveillance and all that, but the, 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 what's happening to the body and what capabilities are for enhancement, quote unquote, uh, I think we shouldn't um, shouldn't overlook that either. Hmm. Yes, actually, um, what I, I wanted to say um, is that first, um, and this is related to um, what Neil said, uh, Nathan and Jakob and Rabbi Laura, it is that first we need to understand how we as uh, or people of religion and religion itself posit themselves in, in this dialogue of AI. So what I saw in my research is, first of all, uh, there are questions related to AI now is begging us questions to religion about human nature, about what means to be human and what means to be a, a human flourishing society. What, what is the project of the human, in fact, that religion defend? And in this case, what, what AI it, it's 
challenging with these uh, new uh, uh, technologies. And on the other side, religions can say, look, what is the project of the human being that AI is going to, um, to propose? And actually it is ongoing with uh, uh, all uh, AI technology that already influences our behaviors and our cognition. So we are already trans on, uh, on a transformative path. So uh, from this point of view, uh, what I want to bring uh, um, here to highlight it's my work on patristics, uh, on anthropology. And I think this, this, this approach in a way responds to both the issues of um, surveillance of how we manage data and on the issues of transhumanism. Because if we, if we focus on anthropology, both on the religion side and both on the AI side, we can better understand what is at stake for each and where uh, they can really have a common ground to discuss about this project of the human being we want to have in the future. Because that, this project will be a common project. It has to be a common project. Uh, a, a religion will have to, and people of religion will have to live with AI. And AI, uh, it's living with people with religion anyway. So I think this is um, an anthropology would, would be the nexus where, why? Because in anthropology, what we talk about uh, body, soul, and mind, what is exactly this, uh, their relationship? Uh, can we talk about a human being without a body? Uh, for example, from a patristic point of view and from a biblical point of view, and I think here, uh, Rabbi Laura can agree uh, from a biblical, there is a unity, there is now a separation uh, from uh, human body and mind. In this case, what is the role of the mind? From a patristic point of view, this is the noose, the noose which is the capacity of discerning. And this is related directly to freedom. And I come here to do, uh, the comment that Neil made from the very first time. And this is what is the weakness? What is the difference between this hu human? Uh, it is having the capacity of freedom. And at least from a, a um, Judeo-Christian point of view, human being, it's the only creature in the universe which has the same trait as God, as a gift done, because human being was created at the image and the likeliness of God. And because of this likeliness, he has this common trait with God, which is freedom. So we can use this freedom and this uh, free will, this capacity of discerning as, as, a, as a way to analyze uh, and to address issue as uh, uh, algorithms, bias, uh, data privacy uh, choices, how much we will have freedom of our own choices because now everything is more constrained. So this is one thing. And the other one, it's about transhumanism. That means what, what, what means to be a superhuman, it's still a human. Uh, what says this about this project of the human being? And not to say um, uh, um, now it is in the end, I think this, this and this kind of discussion, which was already made, you, you say team about, uh, and Rabbi Laura putting um, computer science experts or anyway, technological experts with religious, that was done in Vatican. And it's very interesting to see that you can have this kind of discussion. And I think not only we can have, we have to do it. And uh, in the end, I think we have to be clear, first of all, what I mentioned, what kind of human being we want in the future? What kind of society we want to build? And after we think backwards and say, oh, this is the role we want to give to AI. This is the role we want to give to uh, religions. And this is the project of the human being we want and we have to develop. And in this way, uh, regulation it would come like naturally because I think this is one of the highest issues in AI now because there are a lot of developments, a lot of things already implemented and um, um, a lack of regulation in very important areas that affect, affect us in everyday life. And we, we, we kind of lost control. So we go back to the problem of free, freedom and mm -hmm. to be free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like what we're really talking about here is an anthropological discussion rather than a technological one. Is that something you would agree with, Neil? Yeah, totally. In fact, I, I've sometimes said that actually it would be much better to talk about anthropomorphic intelligence than artificial intelligence. Um, and, and just trying to sort of piece a few different things that people have said together. I think that when you look at humans, and we've talked about um, agency, Laura mentioned agency, and, and Nathan mentioned our vulnerabilities. And these are absolutely critical. I think the more I think about humans and what it's defined to be a human, we're defined by our weaknesses, not our strengths. We're defined by the fact that we die. Um, 
And, and when I think about religion in this context, uh, I mean, it, it's an absurdity to me that a human can ever replace, uh, sorry, a computer can ever replace a human in that way because the, the computer doesn't die in the same way. And, and I'll give you an example of how spirituality can emerge from that. So I, uh, Rabbi Laura kindly invited me to speak at Yom Kippur. Um, and uh, I, I traveled there wearing uh, shoes that my brother, who's unfortunately no longer with us, what used to be his shoes. Now, when people spoke to me on the tube on the way there, people complimented me on my shoes and they were complimenting my brother. And those shoes are a material thing, but they were his choice. So through those shoes, you could see this connection, which is extremely human. You can't emulate this with a computer, right? And those shoes themselves had a spirituality about them. And when we were there, they blew the shofar. And I was listening to that and relating that mentally to what it means for Jewish people culturally to have an object like that that goes through time or through the Abrahamic faiths in general and how similar that is to my shoes. Whether or not you believe in the existence of God, there's a spirituality there that is about humans, our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses, our inabilities to sustain. So when we talk about transhumanism and the notion that we can simply upload ourselves and thereby become gods, you're starting to see something which is very akin to Greek mythology, sort of old religion, what I sometimes think of as like cartoon religion. And what you're seeing is, is a sort of odd desire amongst the non-religious to reach for these, these glories of heaven um, through technology, which is the most extraordinary form of techno solutionism that religions themselves have evolved out of. You know, that's the, that's the days of the sort of Vikings and the, uh, and, and, and the Greek gods. Fasc fascinating stories, wonderful to hear. But, you know, we already understand why that's not interesting. What is interesting is to sit there and say, well, if there is an all powerful thing, if that is an AI and if it is this, if it's much better than what we are, what is our purpose? What is our role? Who are we? Who are we in alignment to that? And there you can see a really interesting thing that religion does is it forces us to introspect and, and wonder about who we are and what role we are. And what you immediately see in your only conclusion is, well, we are our vulnerabilities. We are our weaknesses. We are not our strengths. So if you view us as intelligent beings, ability to process information, well, the computer runs rings around us. But if you view us as people who actually have a really limited ability to process and acquire information, like my ability to communicate in terms of pure sending bits of information is far less than computer. We're a miracle. We're a marvel. We're absolutely extraordinary. And I think that that's why AI alongside religion looks really, really interesting, because you can you can accelerate out of these naive and fairly stupid ideas because you can say, well, actually, culture has done them, has done them in the context of God. And you can actually start to say, well, no, transhumanism to me is 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 is, is akin to the sort of the Greek idea of religion, that, that our objective is to become God. Um, whereas I think in, in, in the modern way, we see that in a very much more complex way. And, and, and actually, the, the true objective is to treasure what we are. And whether, whether you believe that was created or, as I do, that it's just a, a miracle of, of evolution over billions and billions of years, you treasure what exists rather than seek to constantly turn it into something else. And then, you know, to finally sort of relate that to the, the, the point around uh, you know, what the Laura was making, well, well, the reality is that we're being exploited by these things today. It, the real truth is that, um, that there is, we are, what we have created is another form of intelligence, a different form of intelligence that we don't fully understand that computes in ways that are different from us. And we find hard to reason about because it is not human. And we constantly project as if it is human and treat it as if it is human because we tend to anthropomorphize things. Um, and that's highly problematic because at the moment it's exploiting that weakness in us and it's exploiting us to make us do things that are not in our interests, that are interests in the interests of the advertisers or those that are trying to manipulate society or damage democracy. And, and that's kind of what we're faced with at the moment. But what I find so exciting is that, as I think, as, as, as several people, as, as Laura and Nathan have been saying and Nicolette has been implying, is that religious leaders have a lot of the tools to communicate this to congregations, to people, to empower themselves. As Laura says, we need to empower ourselves, engage with this technology and, and treat it as a tool that we can work with rather than something to be afraid of. And we need to get into a position where we're doing that as quickly as possible to prevent ourselves being manipulated by it. Thank you, Neil, that's really fascinating. I wanted to talk, dwell a little bit longer as it's come up a lot, this idea of data, surveillance, capitalism is a term that's often thrown around in this discussion. 
Um, people are familiar with this kind of growing fears around things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal and various things like that. What exactly is the kind of religious contribution to this then? What, 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 what can religions offer that your kind of everyday secular ethicist discussing these issues around data and machine learning couldn't offer? So religious civilizations, religious groups, have been the um, butt end slash victims of surveillance in a terrible way. And uh, one of the things that I think the wisdom of religious civilizations can bring is the very long history and pointing out what can be the ramification of something that looks shiny on the outside, but might uh, have very sinister things on the inside, which is not the technology itself, but the way that it's abused and misused, which is what Neil was talking about. Um, and religions have been very good in the past in the sort of prophetic void of voice of calling out for exploitation. And I think uh, that would come under surveillance, that pointing out what looks helpful, and I don't care if I hand over my data for X, Y, and Z, is actually very problematic for what it does to us as humans, and also possibly dangerous, because religious uh, people, and also we've been absolutely perpetrators, uh, have been at the end of this uh, terrible exploitation and therefore lots of religious people's concerns about uh, how our data is used. Um, can, I'm aware that we have like five minutes. Can I raise a completely different thing, Tim? Go for it. I know it's cheeky of me, but... A little cheeky, but um, I... I think one of the things that's really... We haven't mentioned the word pandemic so far, and I would love to chuck that in because is happening. Um, and some very interesting things have happened in the world of religion and AI during the pandemic. And I think one of the things that has happened because of the ridiculously brilliant change that so many religious um, spaces have had in order to embrace the brilliant thing of virtual um, is that it has questioned not just what is it to be human, but whether we can have certain religious experiences online and the absolutely fascinating discussion in the churches around the meaning of the Eucharist if you're not physically in the space um, how does it you know here we are Ramadan round two I mean luckily we're less locked down um, but that makes a huge difference to us what does it mean to have a virtual iftar? What does it mean to have a virtual Eucharist? What does it mean to have a virtual Seder? These are really fascinating questions about what is God in a pandemic when we are together as community online? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd just like to chuck that in as well. Uh, yes, uh, I, I will comment on um, uh, the virtualization of uh, religious practice and ritual, um, but I wanted to go back to the earlier discussion about the, um, uh, the surveillance society. And of course, I should mention that um, Muslims find uh, Muslim community as a whole uh, finds itself at the very sharp end of that uh, problem in terms of the um, uh, the Chinese surveillance state, which operationalizes uh, digital technologies and AI uh, surveillance techniques against its uh, Muslim uh, population. There, um, but those practices, uh, while they have that um, that severe implementation in in China, they're they're not so far from the. Um, the, the ways we're manipulated in in the in, in Western society, um, and then also uh, Muslim societies have also been um, uh, Muslim countries uh, have also uh, adopted uh, the tools of digital authoritarianism as well to control populations. Uh, so what I think the locus of those problems is not necessarily uh, uh, AI, but it's really related to um, digitalization, digital net technologies as a whole, and our so there, there are two things. One is we, which we've discussed is our self-conceptions and how AI is changing that. But then also there's the issue of how um, AI and digital technologies uh, reshape the world itself. Um, so in order for an AI to interact with the world, that domain needs to be digitalized. Um, and in that process, uh, it's, um, it's made available for uh, control, manipulation, and uh, prediction using AI tools. Uh, so anyway, it makes sense that we have limited time. But the yeah, the question of a religious ritual online is very interesting. Uh, for Muslims, there's a deep um, uh, there's a deep link between um, uh, embodied practice. Um, so for example, just the recitation of, of religious uh, uh, texts, for example, you know, this is a bodily experience. Um, the, uh, the the prayer, the five five daily prayers. 
the, the, the some temporal and spatial orders of, of the way Muslims are linked with their spiritual practices um, with, um, uh, with the world itself. So, uh, you know, our, our prayer times are determined by, um, you know, the, 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 the way that, we're, you know, the time of day, for example, uh, where the sun is. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, there's the, um, the, the, the um, uh, the, 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 the Ramadan, for example, is determined by uh, the moon sighting and so on. Uh, so, so, you know, we, the, the cosmos and hum, human, the human being is linked in, in this higher, or, you know, higher uh, orders of, 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 of reality. Um, and so this is very important for, for Muslims and um, the way these practices, you know, d does the meaning of, of religious ritual, ritual translate when it's uh, uh, done digitally, you know, is, is sacredness retained uh, as uh, the world is digitalized? These are important questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, I want to just come to, to Nicoletta who had a hand up as well. I know you've been doing a lot of research in some of these areas as well. Uh, yes, uh, actually, very, very quickly, we, uh, to come back to the question that uh, Rabbi Laura asked, I think it's a very, very important question. Um, and you are still what, what religion actually can bring which it's compared to the secular approach. Uh, actually, there are two main things that religion uh, that makes religion like the key factor in doing. First of all, it's widespread 85% of the global population uh, consider themselves uh, believers either participating uh, uh, to uh, institutional religion or spiritual, uh, as uh, Neil very well put it, actually, there are plenty of people who, who consider themselves uh, spiritual but not religious, and this is very important to consider too. So you have um, the width, 85% uh, of the population, this one. Second, it is the power of change behavior. This is absolutely important. And uh, I uh, uh, yeah, yeah, just mentioned, you have the rituals, you have the, uh, this is, this is uh, I think, I don't see any kind of institution that has the capacity to change behavior as much as religion, maybe AI, no? <laughs> I'm asking a question, it is challenging, but I think it is, and the endurance, the endurance of the religious behavior and religions from thousands of years, they shape society, they shape, equilibrium powers, they shape economies. So I think these three things make that religions, in fact, do not have really um, a, a real competitor. What I actually think it's religion do not use enough this, uh, this potential they have. Uh, and that's why I invite, uh, and myself, I, I, I am participating uh, both from the sides of uh, religion, but also as, a, um, as an economist and as a scholar in the end, uh, which I, I, I want to interrogate objectively uh, what is my relationship with AI and what, what I expect as a human being, as a Christian uh, fr from AI and how, how, I, uh, how I accept this AI in my life uh, and after a co collective level. But I think this, these things, the um, uh, 85% of the population, you can change behavior uh, extremely significant in a short time through religions and you have endurance. So it's not a, a fashion, a pastime, a, a phenomenon that will, that will live. So I think we have here huge potential. Uh, I just wanted to ask one more question before I start bringing in some thoughts from, from the, our, our guests and from the floor. Um, we've been talking a lot about ethics of AI and, and obviously some of the issues are really prominent around data regulation, but there's other things we haven't touched on yet. The use of algorithms in the criminal justice system or in hiring practices, bias and discrimination and that kind of thing. If, if AI isn't kind of, if these kind of more harmful or dubious practices aren't regulated, brought into check, do you expect to see communities of faith being at the forefront of some kind of public backlash? Would you see if in a future society in which AI is pervasive and, and all encompassing, would people of faith start trying to opt out in a kind of, you know, going back to traditions of hermitage and monastic life in a sense, or in a pushing away this AI life if we can't reshape its ethics? I think withdrawing completely would be not just impossible, but it would be, um, it would be an abdication of responsibility. I think uh, if people of faith uh, have any value in society, they have a value in in trying to make it fair, more more um, you know, uh, work for humane practices, and yeah, look out for the for the people who are generally overlooked or marginalized. So uh, withdrawing 
and uh, checking out completely. I think that would be completely misguided. I do think we will be, uh, and I think this is already the case, we need to be much more intentional about cultivating thick forms of, of community um, and um, developing alternative practices to counteract the, the, the pull towards shallowness, towards uh, just optimization for optimization's sake and all the different subtle values embedded in, in kind of modern technology. I think um, communities of faith are struggling to, to do that, not in a way to completely demonize technology and, and check out, but to, to, be, to be able to be a, a positive force and participate well in the conversations, in the debates, standing up for the weak and, and vulnerable, but checking out entirely would be misguided. Hmm. Some people talk about the development of AI as a kind of novel or even existential threat to religion, while others would say, you know, throughout the history of human beings being religious, there have been new technologies which have often spurred dramatic change, but, you know, people continue to believe, you look at things like the printing press um, and that kind of stuff. Would any, any of our panelists just lastly like to come in quickly and whether they think this is a, the kind of development of AI is a particularly new kind of threat to religion or whether it's just something, you know, the latest uh, technological development which people of faith are going to have to grapple with as they have many times before. Yeah, actually, if we consider that um, regardless the religion that we believe in, God, I think um, I don't see any religious person say he's afraid of anything. And because because this, this faith and this confidence that you are um, in a relationship with the almighty God, uh, in a way, uh, it, it, it frees us, in fact, the fear, because this is uh, the problem. It, it frees us the fear. The relationship with God frees us any person of fear. So the question is not about fear, it's about a positioning, how uh, a, a religious person and religions as institution posit themselves and uh, enter in a dialogue with, with AI. But in any case, in a confrontation, you said this is a confrontation, I would say absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, and I, I second Nathan for say withdrawn will will really be an abdication. Uh, we have the um, we have the tools, and as uh, Neil uh, mentioned, religions have the tools. In fact, to bring one of the most precious contribution to the debate to the debate of AI in society. So this is my last point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, it's, it's quarter two. We've got about 15 minutes left. I wanted to start taking some questions from the floor. People have been good at some people have already been sending some in to me privately. So I'll go through some of those first. Um, we have a question here from from Sarah. Um, she was she, she notes that uh, um, Nicola Noriko Arai's Todai robot, apparently I've not heard of this, came in the top 20 percent on the Japanese university entrance test, which was good enough to get into 60 percent of Japanese universities. Does this mean that uh, machines are brilliant or the system is flawed? And, and following on from that, she asked, do we need a revolution in education to teach human beings what machines cannot learn? So focusing on what is actually essential to being human if machines are already better than us at some of the things we're already used to kind of educating people into. Would anyone like to discuss that idea? Neil? Yeah, I think we have to be quite careful. Um, Test, tested, made, and designed for humans, right? If you if you if you decide to build a computer to approach a test, that's kind of missing the point. Um, you know, it's it's if if I target that test, you don't get into um, a Japanese university because uh, you can complete that specific test well. It's that test has been designed to evaluate a human in you know intelligence, but it assumes that you're also a human. Um, and the really remarkable thing about human beings is their adaptability, right? So the thing that I think that computers utterly fail at today, and the reason we'll see them not involved in uh, interacting with us in any shape or form, is their brittleness, um, their inability to adapt to changing circumstances. I always like, it's this sort of Mike Tyson version of the quote, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, life is about constantly being punched in the mouth and constantly finding things uh, don't go the way you expected or the way you planned. And machines are terrible at dealing with that. So yes, specifically, you can build a machine that can do that test because that's a very planned, closed, confined scenario. But 
what we really as humans what we manage to do is exist in this crazy world where stuff happens all the time from left field from right field and we manage to deal with it we manage to ride it if you look at the history of automation it's a consistent history of the way we automate is we try and find some component of our lives and we compartmentalize that we put it in a factory and then we, we, we file it away. And the unfortunate side effect of that is that we adapt to the machine. We constantly adapt to the machine. And I think what we have to worry about with the age of AI is that we're saying that again. AI is not general intelligence. It can do that specific intelligence test. It cannot socialize at university. It cannot network. It cannot learn, sit in the lectures and absorb the material or connect the material in the right sort of ways and become a functional member of society. Yet what we are doing is creating a world where more and more, we have to react to what the machine tells us to do, just like we have to turn up to work to, because the weaving machines need us there at the same sort of time. Um, and what we really want is a world where the machine adapts to us. And that's incredibly difficult to do. And I worry that we're sort of drifting more and more into being controlled by the machine because we have to adapt to the way it wants the world to be rather than the way we want the world to be. Very interesting. We've got another question here from uh, Andrew Brown. I don't know if, Andrew, you want to ask it directly yourself or I could read it out. You sent it to me earlier. Yeah, no, my question is, where's the intelligence? Um, it's because people talk about it as if it was something in the machine or if it's in the particular program that the machine is running. Um, but obviously this can't be true. Um, and even when you put the program into the machine or the network of machines as they now are, you know, they're constantly being tweaked and fiddled with by humans. And a lot of these big data things are also using us humans as sensors the whole time. I mean, when I ask, where's the intelligence in Google? Well, part of it is, is it's getting sensor information off my smartphone the whole time, you know, that I am telling that entity about the world. And so it seems to me that, and, and this is really what, what I wanted a reaction to, that the intelligence, whatever it is, is, is incarnated. It's distributed over the whole mixture of humans and indeed companies and, and, and machines and programs. And we're all centers in, in Gary Kasparov's sense. Um, so we need to think about the, the unit of artificial intelligence as as the not not the single machine or network of machines, but the the corporation in which it's embedded, is that fair? Anyone would like to come in on Andrew's question, uh, Rabbi Laura? Well, it's a great question. I think um, the intelli I think not anthropomorphizing is very important, and and working out that the intelligence is the capacity that we build. And the only place that I would say is a misnomer for intelligence, but is nearer it, is what I don't understand, but Neil certainly does, around uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning uh, with enough data. But I wouldn't call that intelligence, I would call it capacity. And then you're, it's not a uh, sort of false steer. I think intelligence is a real misnomer here uh, because it is gifting uh machines so funny i always feel like i always feel like apologizing to them i'm really sorry i'm calling you a machine but i am um with uh, which is ridiculous uh with something that just doesn't belong to them yes there is capacity in a way that is really fascinating and interesting and exponential although not more exponential than in other things in history and it definitely shouldn't be called intelligence i also agree with that and i, I wanted to sort of draw out a bit of what I think some of what Andrew was saying, which I think is very, very important, is that um, these are hybrid systems is effectively what I think you were saying, Andrew. Yeah. There's, um, there's our data, there's um, large scale compute, and it's all being mixed in to sort of create an outcome. And I think one of the very severe problems is that the people who are in charge of that outcome don't answer directly to the people from where the data originates. And I see that as one of the very big problems. I think, as you quite rightly put, look, these aren't fully automated systems. I mean, I, so I spent three years in Amazon, as part of which I was deploying machine learning in the Amazon supply chain. Okay. And I would argue that probably the world's largest AI in terms of making auto, where you sort of say, it's making automated decisions in terms of what to buy. Like it, it sort of decides what it's going to buy within the system. 
but how many people are behind the scenes controlling the automated AI? There was me, you know, the hundreds of people sort of tuning it and making sure it does the right thing. And I think that what we really, one of the things I'm very, in my technical work focused on is trying to get out of that by democratizing these capabilities because you need very large amounts of data and you need a large number of people to actually run these systems. And that means it's beyond the reach of sort of normal people to actually to, to take advantage of this technology. And I think that it's, it's a very good point. If you look at the systems that are operational at the moment, they are this hybrid of data coming from people, large scale compute and a large company housing it. And, and that's concentrating the power in the hands of very few people, which we know is always dangerous and worrying, regardless of who those people are. Hmm. Very quickly, because he said something very important, and I think this is a critical point of the discussion where we can understand what's happening. Neil, you said, and they behind behind that those algorithms and that decision, there are uh, um, people who um, were sure that we do the right thing. And I think this is the critical. We need to think what it's the right thing. In fact, you said very well, the right thing. The right thing for whom? What it's this uh, writing of course you said that oh this is not for purpose we know what are the purposes the purposes are um, profit and money but i think we it's very it's very important and actually i mentioned this on another conference we had in washington dc that people exactly who are in these positions understand that their decision and their decision in, in programming when you when you take just one single you you, you put a period instead of a comma where you do so that will impact millions of people and what it's it is the right thing for those people so we need an ethical framework to see what is the right thing uh for, for these people who are behind the scenes as you very well mentioned i think this is very critical what is the right thing and just to say we, we would need to go back to the anthropology and say what is the right thing for the human being for a human for the flourishing of human being and for a good society thank you yeah, so it is to sort of um just quickly coming on that i think it's worse than that there is no right thing for the whole of society and once you've deployed at very scale, there is no single ethical moral framework that should be imposed. Every time someone's tried it, it leads to genocide. And we want a diverse, there's a diversity of values that we want to reflect. And so that it's a worse problem than that. Once this is very widely deployed at scale, it doesn't matter who's in charge and how nice they are. You're going to damage some people because you're imposing someone's values on a very wide section of people. So there is no single ethics that we can suddenly deploy. I mean, and that, that comes back to the, why doesn't an omnipotent God make everything perfect? Well, because perfect isn't defined. There's no such thing. We are free to be who we are. We are free to have our values and our choices. Those are our intention. And as soon as you start deploying large scale yeah. decision makers, you know, whether it's social media or whatever, you get the same problem. Yeah, I fully agree. Mm. Thank you. We've got just time for, for one last question, which has come from Ruth. Um, she asked um, on a completely different topic, uh, but a very important one. Does the panel welcome the, the EU's proposed regulations, which are due to be published tomorrow, but have actually been leaked? And according to the leak, the EU is going to, or is thinking about banning the use of AI for things such as mass surveillance or social credit stores and set out a, a quite a different path from, from what's happening in the US and China. Uh, any any thoughts on that particular kind of policy question? Anyone's been following that story? Yeah, um, I think I think this is a great move. I absolutely agree with this. Um, uh, the idea that this needs really, you know, the the um, uh, creating a mass surveillance and credit scoring society is really needs uh, significant uh, regulatory attention. But um, I mean, the problem is that realizing that is, is really a significant problem because of the nature of digital technologies themselves. I mean, let me just give you an example of a video game environment. So a um, video game environment is inherently, um, especially online connected video games nowadays that, that have become extremely popular, especially with the net, with this, um, uh, the current, you know, the future generations, video games will be a major part of their lives. Um, and that those environments are inherently mass surveillance environments with enormous amounts of telemetry uh, being sent to um, uh, uh, servers and analyzing game performance and and you know uh, you know, setting rewards in, in the game environment and so on. Um, so, but but then also in terms of the, the way things like Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram, the way these these applications work. Uh, they, 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 again, they create, they curate an information and environment for the user. Um, so, 
and and again, every website is is using different, you know, dark patterns and different mechanisms uh, to manipulate, as I say, the information. But so there's a significant need for uh, control of this problem. But um, the, you know, the way digital technologies are set up now is, I think, it's going to be very difficult to implement. Um, any other thoughts on on this question of tougher regulation, whether the EU can carve out a new path as, as the G, like, like they did under GDPR, I guess, of, of having a tougher tougher regulatory environment than you see elsewhere? So I think the interesting thing I, I I've read it only scanned the introduction. Um, I, I think that it doesn't make sense to talk about regulating AI in the same way it doesn't make sense to talk about let's regulate computers you can only regulate things in a context you can only talk about what they're doing and, and oddly in the legislation they start talking about high risk well let's, let's define where high risk is medical devices let's look at the particular problems around social media so on and so forth but i think it's almost confusing to say let's regulate ai i think that it's much better to sort of say well you actually you just as we would have looked at regulating the press I mean, social media is just a modern form of communication. You look at, well, what are the particular problems in social media? GDPR already gives you some really interesting personal data rights, but they're 30 years old. And I mean, that that's kind of a really interesting place to start. But I, I find the whole notion of very confused of let's regulate AI because we can't even define AI. So how can you regulate something you can't define? I mean, what you're basically saying is let's not have bad things happen. Well, yes, that's what we want law to do, but it's a bit more sophisticated than that. And I think talking about the deployment of technology in a context is a much more sensible thing to do. And unfortunately, we already have a lot of very good legislation, consumer protection legislation, medical device legislation, uh, personal data rights legislation. I think the really interesting one is, is what about media, modern media legislation? Um, and what is modern media? I think that's probably a very, very challenging one. Hmm. Right. Well, thanks very much, Neil. I think with that, we've, we've reached the end of our hour. So I'm going to have the Jaws conversation to close. It's a shame I'd love to carry on chatting because there's so many other fascinating things we didn't have a time to go in depth. But I want to thank all our panellists, Nathan, Jakob, Nicoletta, Rabbi Laura and Neil. Thank you for your contributions, for your, for your thoughts on that. It's been brilliant. Thank you to everyone who joined us and asked questions. Hope you found it stimulating and interesting. Uh, there's plenty more information uh, on every kind of interaction between religion and the news on the Religion Media Centre's website. Uh, that's religionmediacenter.org.uk. So please do check out fact sheets, explainers, links, videos, lots of great stuff. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I hope, uh, thank you for joining us and I hope you all have a, uh, a good rest of your hopefully quite sunny afternoon. Cheerio, everyone.